The only way brands and businesses survive and grow is if they create a benefit, not just a feature, not just a thing. I can, it could be a service industry. We created a brand called um, Show Me for Rogers. We created a brand called Fido for Bell, right? Not Fido, Five. Can't even remember my own brands, right? But those are services. They're actually, you can't go out and buy a show me. Right? It's a service. So it doesn't have to be just around something that you make. But what business is it in? When we did this for Crayola, guess what their first answer was? I asked their management committee at Crayola, what business are you in? And guess what answer I got? What would you think? Entertaining keys. Hmm? Entertaining keys. Well, they weren't even that creative. <laughs> the guy looked at me and said, we make crayons. You know, okay, crayons. And I went, hmm, I just wrote down crayon. This is a magic marker. There's your logo on it. That's not a crayon. Okay, we make magic markers and crayons. <laughs> we make writing instruments. Da, 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 da. Well, an hour and a half later, do you know what business they were in? Creativity. Enabling, create, enabling creativity, not even just with kids. The young lady that ran their product development group immediately said, so that means we could, based on our competencies and with our definition of the business that we're in, we could draw, develop a whole line of high-end products for professionals, architects, draftsmen, engineers, enabling creativity. That's what you do, right? You create living spaces that people love. Yes, the answer, yes, you could. You still have to have a business case to do it. But as soon as you start answering the question what business your brand is now going to be in, and it starts with what you make or what you sell, you've immediately taken your competitive opportunities, your revenue streams, your channels to distribute, boom, and go like that. But when we started Chorus Entertainment, I was actually put into a completely different world. Because I grown up in beer, and it was kind of a male-oriented product. The more men drink, the more beer than women do. That's changing, but at the time it was very new. Suddenly, here we were creating a children's entertainment company. Babar, Franklin the Turtle. <laughs> so I had to go from Budweiser to Franklin the Turtle overnight. <laughs> If I wanted to start a company, I was going to start a company based on my reputation. The equity that my brand had created in the market. And the way it, I would have to manage that would be the same as whether I was managing Franklin the Turtle or Budweiser or Maxwell House Coffee. The system is the same. The approach, the disciplines are the same. But the way and some of the questions that you ask within that system have to be different. Why? Because it's about you. And the first fundamental to branding yourself as an entrepreneur is what I call love what you got, you got what you love. Have a vision. You don't start with a product. Wow, look, I can make these little books, or I can make this handset, or this bottle of water, or, no disrespect Erica, this wonderful high-end chocolate. Well, that's great. You can make that. But what if nobody wants it? And what if you find five years into having made it, and figure out how to make more of it, you realize, wow, I really don't like making chocolate anymore. Now what do you do? You end up going backwards. Life isn't about going backwards, it's about going forward. Erica, I
competitors. I love I, the fact that you said, I really don't have or I might have one competitor in Toronto. <laughs> no. You got a whole bunch. <laughs> you just might not know about them. Yeah. Right? And as soon as you secured your contract with Four Seasons, guess what? You're in their crosshairs. Uh. They know you. You might not know them. Right? So, making sure that you ask the questions about the business to protect yourself from competitors or changes in the market. Well, if you're not happy and, and, and really committed to what you're doing, you probably won't realize that you've got competitors. And an entrepreneur's vision, I've always thought, should be rested not in what you're good at doing or where you've worked or what experience you've gained over your career, short or long. It should actually be vested in what you love doing. Asking yourself what vision you want to create for your brand actually therefore has to start with you. Because you need to be 100% confident. Nobody else. To be a good entrepreneur, to launch a company, you really only need one person's support to start a company. Who's the one person? Yourself. So if you can't articulate that vision for that thing that's going to grow and people are going to flock to over time, why would you expect the market to be able to articulate it? Why would you expect an employee to want to come and work at your company if you can't articulate that vision? Your reputation is an intangible asset. And you want people being able to articulate it. You want them to say the same thing about your reputation so that you can grow the value of that asset in the goodwill market. It has financial, it links to financial value. The other piece of advice I wanted to pass on is when you're an entrepreneur, you're all by yourself, which in many ways is a good thing because it makes it very easy for you to make decisions. It's also very scary because it forces you to do everything, at least initially. I do tell a story in this book that we've put out I started level five, this is a true story, in my underwear at the kitchen table. <laughs> All by myself. I didn't need to get dressed up, right? I'm staying at home. So I'm going to be comfortable. <laughs> well, that lasted for a while, but at some point, you have to sell, right? People have to buy it from you. Value has to exchange hands, largely for that benefit that you've created. And if it truly is a benefit that's unique and is what you're passionate about and it shows, they will pay a premium for that, I'll bet you, especially on Eden Bridge Drive. So learning how to sell as an entrepreneur is a very difficult thing. Part of selling as an entrepreneur when you're selling yourself and your reputation is looking at it not as business development, but as developing business. And you go, uh, eh, eh, just a, he's just being like a smart aleck with the word. Well, no, business development is in fact a process, a thing you do. X number of calls, fill a funnel, get a return call, move them down the funnel, get to a sale, get to a proposal, bop, 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 bop. right? Which every entrepreneur needs. But developing business is not a process. It's actually part of the passion that Erica's got. The reason she's here gladly sharing with you her story is because who knows, maybe you'll become a customer. Things like this. I tell you, I respect every single one of you for being here. Not because you got to sit through my drone on, but you're, I respect you because you're, you're networking. You're taking time to get to know other people. I learn something every day in my business because of the great brands I'm lucky and the people I'm allowed to be around, like Wah and, and our other teammates from Level 5. If 
you've put yourself on something you love, that you're good at, if you have protected it by making sure it's healthy and you're healthy, and you manage a benefit, not a product, and you have figured out how to always sell by developing networks and relationships, you can create a very sustainable brand for yourself, regardless of what business it might be in. So I'll stop there, and I think we've got time for some questions. The value of a promise consistently kept. As a brandaholic, that's my definition of what a brand is. It's value, and it does start with that. Soft and hard value, financial, but your happiness, etc. Uh, the promise, what is, what's the benefit you are going to provide in the market better than anybody else in, in, in a differentiated way. And then, I think most of where your question is, is, okay, great, how do I consistently keep that promise? So in the first two, three years of level five, um, I, became, I was the single largest growth enabler. Because right? we were trading on my reputation. And the promise was all about my experience and my capabilities. Well, after about three years, I became the single largest growth inhibitor. I can't be in more than maybe two, with technology today, places at once. So I guess that means we only ever always have two clients. Cultures are the way people interpret your intentions. Right? Is the direction clear? The vision. Are the values and how we're going to treat one another? Are there penalties if you don't act that way? Are you consistently applying it in the kind of people that you hire? If you don't have that as foundational rock bed, it's hard to build and sustain anything. And that's the toughest thing to do, is to find, it sounds, like you're into executive coaching, you know how tough it is to do what I'm talking about. Because you can't go to a store and buy a culture. You can't order a culture online and plop it in and here it goes. It's tough because the culture probably reflects you as the owner, the entrepreneur, the founder. It reflects your values. So you're kind of putting it out there and hope to God people respect it. True partners in a startup, you have to both be inspired by that common vision. You can't have somebody that's not fully vested, and I don't just mean financially. Passionately, determination, drive, persistence, because you're gonna get, you gotta get through the tough times just like you will share the, the high times. So getting that articulated and getting those values down and what you mean by integrity or honesty or whatever, by behavior, if you can both go, yes, and they can almost finish your sentence when you're talking about those, there's your partner. <laughs>